me sitting on top of it, it's even more thrilling than that. Some of those cheers you heard in the background were some of the rookies on board, I think, saying, all right, we're finally going. <laughs> there come the solids. That's a little over two minutes after liftoff, and they fall back in or parachuted in the ocean. It takes from liftoff about eight and a half minutes, and you're going 17,500 miles an hour, and that's one heck of a ride. I'm going to introduce you to that crew of seven that Mr. Beggs indicated. This is the, my pilot, John McBride. And there's a poor old CDR over there trying to mine the store. Our Canadian, Mark Grenot, one of the payload specialists we had on board, did a fantastic job. Mission specialist, Dave Elisma, another Annapolis graduate, made, by the way. <laughs> Kathy Sullivan. <laughs> the oceanographer we had with us, Paul Scully Power. Another mission specialist, Dr. Sally Ride. This shows Sally uh, picking up the satellite that we deployed, called an Earth Radiation Budget Satellite. We used the, uh, the arm to lift it out and deploy it, and this was the first of our trials on orbit. It has a couple of solar arrays, and the first time that uh, we tried to deploy those arrays, things didn't function exactly normal. And then later on in the day, with a little persistence, they did function well, and you see both arrays deployed there, the silver panels up to the top, they will power the spacecraft through what now is estimated to be per perhaps a seven-year lifetime. Actually, those uh, arrays, we did run into some kind of problem, which was probably thermal associated and uh, the persistence of the ground coming up with new ideas to way to warm it up and uh, Sally stroking it nicely with the arm, it managed to get out. And this shows the deployment sequence as she pulls the arm away. Big John McBride backs the, uh, the shuttle away from the, uh, from the satellite and the uh, satellite uh, was essentially motionless after that deployment, and uh, they had been concerned about having to expedite turning on its attitude control system, and that was completely unnecessary because the shuttle does such a nice job of, of deploying it. And the satellite is up and functioning well. We fly the vehicle not only from uh, up forward, but uh, back aft. Most of our on-orbit operations, are, when we do fly the shuttle, are done from the compartment where, uh, where John is. This shows uh, Mark Garneau assembling a very sophisticated photographic apparatus called, in his t terms, OGLO. It's a high-resolution image intensifier that looked at this aft end of the shuttle and looked at how it glows in the low Earth's atmosphere. And here you see the shuttle passing at about the same rate that we observed it out the window across the Nile Delta. And as we progress through the film here, you'll see other probably familiar areas around the Red Sea. And that gives you somewhat a feel of the rate that you go over the Earth at about 120 nautical miles. There's the Sinai Peninsula, the Gulf of Aqaba, and the Gulf of Suez. The films really don't do it justice. The Mark I human eyeball is probably the world's best se image sensor, and the slow but superb analog computer of the brain does a great job. This is Mark exercising another one of his devices. It's a photometer looking out a side hatch window that we have that uh, passes UV that he was trying to, trying to study. Still coming across to Egypt. Actually, what uh, Kathy was just saying is, is really true. We've never been able to, to capture it adequately with films. We had a, quite a sophisticated array of other experiments in the payload bay, and we'll be looking at them here in some detail. What the panel you see folding aft towards the vertical fin right now is the one leaf of the imaging radar antenna that operated almost continuously during the remaining seven days of the flight. And all of us were involved at various times keying sequences into the computer and keeping that running. Here you see Sally working with a small onboard computer that we use to supplement the orbiter's computers to control and monitor a very sophisticated experiment designed to show that we could resurface a satellite on orbit, and that is the experiment for which Dave and I did the uh, EVA or spacewalk on day seven. We'll hop around the payload bay and introduce you to those experiments now. The imaging radar antenna fully opened up is on your left. Aft of it on the starboard side was a high-resolution uh, metric camera called large format camera, and to its right, the orbital refueling system, or hydrazine transfer, demonstration. Two smaller experiments on the same shelf that held the radar are designed to try to make Landsat satellites smart enough to classify their own scenes and to map carbon monoxide in the Earth's atmosphere. Actually, Kathy is putting up the salvage of all astronauts, some Velcro strips. The Velcro is still saving the space program, and she's sprinkling some extra around the, the cabin right now. Dave is uh, activating a 
a controller that we use to fly what NASA refers to as getaway specials. There are little canisters that we can put out in the payload bay, and um, we, our only interface with them is to turn them on and off. It seemed we don't have dark enough to show very well, but uh, that was Gibraltar. This is to show not only by this film, but by some uh, documentary evidence that we do a lot of photo documentation on orbit, still photography with 35 millimeter and 70 millimeter cameras of ourselves and of the ground and various experimental setups. And this is Sally again maneuvering the mechanical arm on one of the days that we had trouble stowing or refolding the Serbi antenna. She brought the arm down to uh, where it latches itself shut, and as you'll see in just a second here, gently tapped on the latch mechanism so that the little claw would come out over the striker bar and secure the antenna in the payload bay. Mr. Beggs indicated to you the international aspects of the program. Uh, the arm itself was built uh, up in Canada by an outfit called SPAR, and it's been a marvelous asset to the shuttle. We, uh, we thought we had seven people aboard, but when we opened up the airlock, it looked for a moment like we had an eighth. We called this guy Ralph for a while. It's actually the backup spacesuit that we carried in case we had any troubles with uh, either Dave's or my primary suit. All three functioned just flawlessly. The suits have really accumulated a very superb track record in the last couple of shuttle flights with EVAs, and they were just a delight and a great confidence factor to use. Kathy said to me that I, you're not going to film John putting on my medical sensors, are you? <laughs> we were going to enter this clip to the caption contest. It's probably great material. And this is Dave, you see, out in the payload bay already, and this is the uh, first chance I had to stick my head out the hatch on our EVA on day seven and take a look at the payload bay and get squared away with all our tools to go back and do the hydrogen refueling task. Those suits weigh about 225 pounds on the Earth, and it, it would usually take some combination of Dave or John or I to move one around in the training sessions. Uh, if they're just a breeze on orbit, zero-G is a wonderful thing, and they're really pretty comfortable devices as pressure suits go to uh, work in. Dave at this point is passing across the uh, handrails that go along the forward bulkhead of the orbiter's cargo bay and getting ready to go aft to where he'll lock his feet into a foot restraint and start doing the hydrazine refueling task, which you see in progress here. And I picked up a set of tools that we needed to supplement that and came back and joined him primarily to assist and document, and both of us making sure that neither of us forgot anything along the way. This facility actually simulated a uh, connection or valve connection that is flying aboard the Landsat satellite to prove that we could go up and uh, make a connection with that type of device and actually transfer hydrazine or refuel it on orbit. And in my opinion, is the next major step in doing what we're going to be doing in the future, and that's satellite servicing. The uh, shelf that you see above and below Dave's hands are uh, just mock-ups that simulate the geometry on a Landsat spacecraft exactly, and the cluster of four valves where Dave is putting the tools on is exactly the kind of cluster that uh, is used to service the spacecraft on the ground. Our exercise here basically was designed to show that we could change our mind about a satellite that we had not intended to fuel on orbit, and with a sophisticated set of tools, modify the ground valve so that it could be reserviced on orbit and the tool design and the hydrazine transfer rig itself, all of which were designed and built at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, just performed flawlessly through the whole flight. Actually, Kathy and Dave made this task look very easy, and the reason they made it look easy was something that John Young taught me a long time ago, and that was practice, practice, practice. They had done this numerous times in our water tank in, uh, in Houston, and uh, that practice paid off. We had had a, another failure in one of the orbiter's communication systems on day two of the flight that was a potentially severe impact to the, especially the radar experiment. And uh, in an attempt to get around some of that uh, impact and lessen it, we were asked by the ground while out EVA to go and uh, manually reposition this communications antenna that you see there and uh, set it up so that locking pins could be driven into their slots and we could fix it so that it would come back into the orbiter's payload bay on entry day. And this would allow the experiment and other days operations on orbit once we were certain we could close that antenna back up when we needed to. Uh, additionally, since we had had some problems with the Serbi radar antenna, I was asked to take a, an inspection tour, as it were, while we were out in the payload bay and make sure that all the different leaves of the antenna were stacking correctly uh, when we folded it up. And that fortunately also proved to be the case. So as you see here, Dave 
waiting a little bit after the pallet so we could keep our tether lines clear and I coming back up from looking at both antennas. Uh, we've managed to put three tasks together successfully on the EVA and set ourselves up very well for another day and a half of productive operations on orbit. It's, uh, this flight, very satisfyingly to me, was really abundant testimony to the value of having people aboard an operation, both on the ground and on the uh, spaceborne end of things, to take account of the unforeseen and uh, turn potential failure into great success. As Kathy mentioned earlier, did a lot of photography. One of the things that uh, was going on there was John was working in a black bag, changing some film out. Uh, one of the things that Mark Garneau was looking at extensively was something that we refer to as space adaptation syndrome, which is meaning I don't feel good once I get in space. Uh, and he was running through some of those exercises with, um, with Paul Scully Power. I conned Crip into letting us put this clip into the film. As a former volcanologist, those are the Canary Islands sliding by the orbiter's tail. And that, again, is about natural rate. One of the mundane things you have to do up, uh, up in space is eat. We sat down and had our three meals a day. Uh, nothing else, uh, just having the meals gives you a, a chance to, to relax a little bit from the, a rather hectic day's activity, which it can be. Uh, the food is, is good. It can be a, a way to sit back and relax. We do get some fresh things up there nowadays, like uh, such as these carrots. <laughs> Mark's going to lose the thing there. <laughs> one of the one of the things I'm asked about is uh, how do you get seven people in a in a craft that size and you take advantage of all the volume you have. Uh, there's Kathy up on the what would be called the ceiling down here on Earth, and there's Sally on the wall over there, and uh, <laughs> somebody's down on the floor. And the and the bread will come by momentarily. Right. If you, if you kind of get the idea, if you look around the room, look above your head at all the volume that's being wasted in here in zero G, we'd have all tables everywhere. And now this final bit of the film is our version of a quiz. Uh, it is rumored there were seven people on this flight, but we challenge you to count the crew members. <laughs> Don't quit yet. Keep counting. <laughs> The other way of getting seven people on board is to keep them moving. <laughs> Nobody holds still. Commander was obviously out of control again. One small point about having seven people on board. Uh, that was the size of the original astronaut group, the Mercury 7, and we tucked them all in one spacecraft. That was Josephine, which was giving us a little problem. We thought weather-wise for landing, Crippen had had some problems trying to get back into the Kennedy Space Center, but fortunately the, uh, the weather cooperated for me this time. We managed to get in on runway 33. Actually, when I came over Jacksonville, Florida, doing Mach 4, I could see the runway, and I was still about 100 miles away. That's the kind of VFR weather I like. For those pilots in the group, it's a nice flying vehicle, it really is. We touched down and uh, stopped to a little about 3,500 feet remaining on our 15,000 foot runway and uh, all we did was moderate braking so there was no problem trying to, trying to get on that size runway as we've proven in the past. Here's uh, seven rather happy people coming out, and I guess I'd like to reiterate what Kathy said. One of the things that made me proudest about this flight was we once again proved, just like Pete Conrad did when he repaired the Skylab, is that having people involved can make the difference between failure and success. Thank you very much for letting us share this with you tonight.